who is our current Merrill House resident, uh, and I'm doing this via the miracle of electronic communication. Claire is at 107 Water Street, and I am around the corner in the former Barrow Schoolhouse, appropriately in what I have been assured is the uh, former first grade classroom. Claire and I have several things in common. Our fathers are, or were, physicians. Farrah Strauss Giroux is our publisher. The epigraph to her forthcoming novel comes from a poet whose work I have loved for more than half a century and about whom I have written. That's Adrienne Rich. We both admire wind turbines, and we also both admire nuns. We were both English majors, of course. These are not as important, I think, as the things that separate us, generational, gender, interests, etc. I always feel grateful when I'm introduced to a new writer with a fresh voice and a new vision, especially when she makes me see aspects of the world that are not normally part of my experience. Raised in Chicago, educated at Brown and the University of Oregon, Claire is a rising star with short fiction published already in Plowshares, Granta, Kenyon Review, Glimmer Train, Virginia Quarterly Review, and the Iowa Review. A recent story, New Bees, won a Pushcart Prize. She's had plenty of residencies at the McDowell Colony, whoops, don't say colony anymore, uh, <laughs> at McDowell, at Yaddo, the Malay Colony, perhaps that's another whoops, and the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts. She's currently on the staff of John Carroll University in Cleveland. Let me say something about her nuns, who assume starring roles in her novel, which is called Agatha of Little Neon. They are tough, they can be salty. They live in a halfway house in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, of which Sister Agatha, the narrator, says, I'm quoting, from a map, the city of Woonsocket looks like a gallbladder, a little pouch. They are tough cookies, practical, inventive, thrifty, sometimes girlish. They know they can get an audience for Bible study by offering free jars of mustard. Who doesn't like free mustard, one of them asks. <clears throat> they are utterly irresistible. They live with addicts who have names like characters from Damon Runyon, Lawnmower Jill, or Horse. They play Gin Rummy and Mahjong. Their house sounds like something from Carson McCullers, and their author often sounds like a Northern Flannery O'Connor. I will say nothing about the plot other than the book, other than the fact that the book is neatly structured why shouldn't it be? Sister Agatha is a geometry teacher, neatly structured into three parts, poverty, chastity, and you guessed it, obedience. And that it involves a crisis of vocation and a rebirth of its central character. Claire Lucette has an ear for dialogue, an eye for detail, a brain for metaphor, and a mind for speculation. One small moment at the end of this book brought me nearly to tears. Naturally, it had to do with grammar, and grammar is the English major's friend. Sister Agatha, having left her order, has enrolled in courses at the local community college. Taking a French class, she has asked, did I understand the perfect tense? Of course, the entire novel has been an exercise in imperfection. And then she says, from where I stood, it seemed my whole life was something I used to do, but did not do anymore. I had hoped that Claire would read from her novel this afternoon, but she can't. Her agent has forbidden her to do so, and Claire is obedient to authority. But I know she will happily answer questions about it and other aspects of her work following a reading of a piece of short fiction. And if I may make a plug on behalf of all of us here at the Merrill House, if you who are watching are enjoying this programming, please support the Merrill House by donating on our website, jamesmerrillhouse.org. And now I'm happy to welcome Claire Lucette to you. 
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Willard. What a generous introduction. Um, it's such a gift to be read by someone so intelligent and so attuned to how language works. Um, so thanks so much. That was really nice. And thank you to the entire James Merrill House Committee, um, especially Bergen O'Malley, for working to make this reading happen. It's been such a beautiful month for me um, in the middle of a really difficult and strange and terrible year. Um, so I feel really lucky that this residency was able to work out um, and that I've been here for the past few weeks. Um, so I'm going to read a story that was in this spring's issue of VQR. Um, and this is a story that I started working on after I finished one of many drafts of my novel. Um, and I was thrilled to be able to focus on the story form um, for a little bit. It was such a relief. Um, and at the time I was looking for a part-time job and I wanted something really mindless and brainless. Um, and I saw that there was a sales position at a lighting store and that intrigued me enough to write a short story about it, um, but not enough to actually apply for the job. <laughs> So um, the story is called The Tobacconist. There was a period of my life when I saw wounds all around me. And so of course the chandeliers were uteruses. Uteruses of crystal and chrome suspended in air, brass fallopian tubes. Dozens of them hung in the shop. Some were gorgeous, some tacky, but none of them could be called hostile, like my own womb. I'd been hired to sell the chandeliers, but mostly I dusted them. The store was in a strip mall on Route 83. Next door was the tobacconists. Sometimes the tobacconist mail was delivered to us by mistake, and I'd bring it to her. The walls of her shop were made to look like wood, but anyone could tell they were paneling. She had shelves full of cigar boxes in every color, their labels romantic, gilded, the letters Barnum-esque. There were humidors and pipes and ashtrays and lighters displayed behind glass. There was occasionally an old man smoking on the couch. From the back corner, a droopy dog looked out at the store. I suspected the dog had emphysema Sometimes I heard it produce a wet cough, but the tobacconist herself seemed in good health. I never once saw her smoke or pack her lip. She was petite and had luminous skin and wore a double-breasted blazer every day. Her fingers were ringless, her gray hair blown smooth. Each time I handed the tobacconist her mail, she gave me a piece of candy for my trouble. I picked a different color of candy every time, but they all tasted the same, cigar smoke. I respected the tobacconist. She was elegant and important, an expert on her inventory. She alone, I imagined, knew the difference between all the identical log-like cigars that sat snugly wrapped in cellophane, packed away, waiting to be transformed into taste and smoke. I thought often of what it seemed we had in common. We both sold things that lit up, but her days were spent giving people things that would ultimately disappear while I helped people acquire things that never would. Chandeliers were lumbering, permanent decor, and I was starting to find there was not much to admire about permanence. The strip mall looked out on Route 83 and when there were no customers, I stood at the front window and watched cars rush past. Near the end of the day, I watched for my wife's car. My wife was six foot two and made the beer at a brewery in Brookfield. The car was her dead grandmother's and my wife hadn't had it cleaned since the woman died. I kept finding cough drop wrappers and limp years old French fries between the seats. When my wife picked me up, she stank of malt and sweat, but I loved getting in the car, both because of pheromones and because I was thrilled to leave the chandelier store behind. 
Some afternoons, I was certain I'd spotted her car early. That silver sedan there. And my heart surged with joy. My wife, she'd come early to save me from this incandescent hell. But then every silver car belonged to someone else, someone who left me behind. The chandelier store made my eyes ache in their sockets. I would have preferred to work at the tobacconists or the Fannie Mae chocolates or even the submarine sandwich shop with the mealy bread and the piles of wet sliced meats. Anything would be better than spending eight hours a day trapped inside with our inventory. The chandeliers plugged into the wall and were controlled by a master switch that I was not permitted to touch. At night, when I closed my eyes, I could still see the bulbs recast as blobs of purple and gold. Even worse than the lights was the music. My boss, Lev, streamed Bach and Mozart from a subscription service, but he had not opted for the ad-free version. After every few symphonies, there was a commercial for legal counsel or fast food or discounted appliances. In one, a man offered solutions to debt. Check me out on the web, he said, at http colon slash slash www.freedomfromdebt.com slash new take on life slash relief now slash Douglas. There was a pause and then that's http colon slash slash www.freedomfromdebt.com slash new take on life slash relief now slash Douglas. Lev liked to talk to me about his son, who was a high school gymnast, and about the chandeliers, which he thought of as the soul of the home. His favorite was the tiered one made of Murano glass. If you read the stats on how many people's sex lives improve after they buy a chandelier, he said, you'd want one too. I considered this. I wondered if it was obvious to Lev that in the past two years, my wife and I only touched each other when, four times a month, she stuck a syringe of sperm inside me. Even then she wore gloves. And recently we'd given up on that routine too. It had been a week since we told her friend whose first and last names were both Omar, who'd been so generous that he could stop giving us vials of ejaculate on ice. Lev came some nights to leave notes for me throughout the store. I'd find them in the morning. Thea, one note read, taped to the arm of a vintage brass fixture. Dust this. I dusted it and then sat down and painted my nails lavender. The next day, there was a new note in the same spot. Good job, Thea. The chandeliers, Lev told me, were meant to be seen, not touched. But when he wasn't around, I didn't try to stop customers from fingering the strings of crystals. I said nothing when they touched the brass arms or pinched the fake flames that were made to flicker atop the imitation candles. People didn't come to be denied. They came with visions. They came with voids to fill. They came with checkbooks and credit cards. These people had high ceilings and they wanted huge, heavy nodes of crystal and brass. They wanted thousands of crystals dangling above them. They wanted Montgolfiers and neoclassicals. They came and pointed at the broad ones, the ones that cast reflect the, the ones that cast refracted light onto the wall. And in awe, these people reached out their hands. And I felt I was in no position to deny them the chance to feel what would someday hang out of reach. I've been working in the chandelier store about six months when the tobacconist came and asked me for help. She was sorry to bother me, she said, but she was having trouble with her computer. She had already called her sister for advice, but her sister was having a colonoscopy the next day and drinking the prescribed laxative solution had turned her impatient and unkind. The look on the tobacconist's face, it made pity puddle inside me. I flipped the sign on the window and followed her next door. In her dim shop, the tobacconist took me by the elbow, past a pyramid of boxed cigars 
and a rotating tower of luxury chrome lighters. She had a tight grip on me, like she was afraid I might turn back. But she let go when we were behind the counter, where she gestured to the glowing computer. On the monitor was a woman's dating profile. It took me a minute to realize that the woman was the tobacconist. There she was in JPEG form, smiling back at me from the screen. She seemed like a different woman than the one standing next to me. In the photo she'd uploaded, she was decades younger. Her cheeks were flushed and her hair lighter and cropped close. I couldn't help myself. I looked too long at the screen. The profile stipulated that she was looking for women between the ages of 30 and 85 and was interested in both casual sex and long-term dating. My face went hot and I turned away, but the tobacconist exhibited no self-consciousness about granting me access to this information. She swatted the monitor like it had offended her. It won't let me click, she said, and pressed the mouse again and again. She dragged a finger across the keyboard and nothing happened on the screen. It won't let me do anything. I showed the tobacconist that when you pressed three keys at once, the computer provided itself the opportunity to start again. When the screen went black, the tobacconist beamed in gratitude, then slipped out of her gray double-breasted blazer and dropped it on the back of her chair. Without it, she looked frail. We stood stiffly while the machine purred itself off and on again. In those quiet seconds, the tobacconist stared at the screen and I stared at the tobacconist. She didn't have the posture of a lonely person. Her hair, I thought, was too coiffed, her jackets too sharp for her to be lonely. Where had she stored her longing? I thought a person someday outgrew her need for other people, gave it up like a tacky pair of old shoes, but maybe I was wrong. When the computer glowed again, the tobacconist asked if she need to start from the beginning and I said she would, her work had not been saved. She looked like she might cry. She said, it took me all morning to pick a photo of myself and the typing, the typing takes forever. We were both relieved when I offered to help. She because the work would be easier and I because I had a reason to stay. When the tobacconist told me what to write, her voice took on a thrill I hadn't heard throaty and melodic and strange. The information rushed from her as if she was helpless to withhold it. She told me to say she was 58. She wanted them to know she liked estate sales, Edwardian poetry, bird watching, the nightly news. She had been in the tobacco industry for decades. I believe we are living in the golden age of tobacco, she said. Did you get that? I nodded. She said, I was married to a man for many years, but she told me not to include that part. She said she'd like to include a description of her dog, the very dog who was watching me from the floor, blinking in a bored way, whose name I learned was Theodore. She'd been on the waiting list to adopt a dog like Theodore for years. And then one day she got a call that her time had come she drove nearly 200 miles to a farm in Wisconsin, and there he was, waiting in a plastic bucket. The whole drive home, she kept pulling over to give him the chance to pee on the side of the road. She loved him dearly, but he had been challenging to train. I tried to imagine what kind of person would be interested in this information, and I briefly considered ignoring the tobacconist and curating her profile myself. I would describe her as she had existed in my mind, attractive and full of conviction, lustrous hair, adorable ears, pretty and poised. Someone who was known for her good taste and candor. She'd been to all the glamorous places I was sure, Monaco and Milan and all the islands named after male saints. I could have said a million things I was sure were true of the tobacconist, all the things that had drawn me to her, but I conceded that perhaps the tobacconist rather than I was the expert on herself. 
The tobacconist showed me the photo she wanted to use, the one that had been frozen on the computer screen before. And when it was uploaded, I clicked save, and I decided the time had come for me to say something about myself. I told the tobacconist I had met my wife online, and so I had a good feeling about the tobacconist's prospects. She was bound to meet someone. The tobacconist, the tobacconist got this knowing look. Ah, she said, your wife, the woman who comes each day in the silver car. That's her, I said. I hope for that kind of luck, the tobacconist said. Then she picked up her jacket and slipped an arm through a sleeve. Her other arm got lost looking for a way in and she twisted her hand in the air, desperate for the slot. I reached out and raised the sleeve to her. When she turned, she thanked me and handed me a piece of butterscotch. It tasted like ash, but I sucked on it until it disappeared. That afternoon, a woman in a green Fannie Mae apron came into the store. She had dark hair and wired glasses. A cell phone was pressed between her shoulder and her cheek. It's hard to say, she told her phone. It's really hard to say. I think the medicated shampoo only works sometimes. They lay eggs, you know. The best thing is to just cut it off. From behind the counter, I asked, can I help you find anything? The woman did not turn to look at me when she spoke. I'm good, she said. Her voice was sing-songy. Then into her shoulder, no, not you, I was talking to this lady. I watched the woman remove her eyeglasses and stick an entire lens in one mouth, then the other. They came back foggy and she wiped each with the corner of her apron. Satisfied, she replaced the glasses. I say just shave the head. When she turned to go, she reached out and gently spun the Murano glass. I called, that's one of my favorites. This was a lie. I don't have favorites. I don't have any I like. The woman didn't turn back. And then the door swung shut. Late in the day, the tobacconist came back into the chandelier store, breathless with excitement. She had a date, she said. A date, I just had to tell you. Oh, how thrilling, I said and smiled. But envy kinked up inside me the breakneck speed with which her prospects had changed. When I walked out to my wife's car that evening, I saw the tobacconist buckled into the driver's seat of her own car. She was sitting up straight, her face near the rear view mirror, and with one hand, she pushed a mascara brush through her eyelashes. There was a moment before my wife drove away when our eyes met in the slim mirror and the tobacconist saw me looking. On the drive home, my wife told me about the beer she had made that day. She spoke of milling and mashing and fermenting, of tanks and hops and wort. She always described her work like I understood, which was generous or perhaps delusional. For years, she'd been telling me about brewing beer and I'd always nodded along, but the words meant nothing to me. I still didn't know the difference between a lager and an ale it was far too late now to admit it. But my wife did not need to know I was following along. I could have been anyone, any warm body in the passenger seat, and she would have said all the same things. Our condo had belonged to my wife before it belonged to us. She was the first woman I had ever lived with. I'd only had male roommates, nice boys who studied medicine and liked fantasy role-playing board games based on medieval myths. They wore headphones most of the time and ate meals that came frozen in individual portions, packed in boxes, pizza bagels, pigs in blankets. My wife prepared meals of many parts. That night she boiled lentils and cut tofu into cubes, put a sheet of broccoli in the oven to roast. I put silverware on the table and told my wife about the woman in the apron who had come in and spoken about the lice. Now I'm afraid I have lice too, I said, and I looked for a reaction on my wife's face. This was not true, of course. I only wanted my wife's concern. 
and to feel her hands on my head. But then the smoke detector shrieked at us. The broccoli had been forgotten and smoke was streaming from the oven. My wife snapped off the oven and turned to push a window open, then stood on a chair to twist the squawking device from the ceiling. Here, I said, and reached to take it from her, but she ignored me and stepped down, the disc in one hand. She pushed the reset button and when it was silent, placed it on the counter. I said, wow, what a godsend that thing is. It seems we're living in the golden age of smoke detectors. Yeah, my wife said after a second. She pulled the broccoli from the oven and let it drop into the trash. I was being punished, I knew. My wife hadn't said as much, but I knew she was disappointed that for all our trying, I kept being not pregnant. My infertility seemed karmic, deserved. All my youthful larks, the flings and indiscretions. I'd been a fool to think there would be no repercussions. The hooky and the pot smoking, the speeding on the interstate, the Cheetos, the nights of a hundred beers, the nail polish that contained trace amounts of lead. I'd always thought my fertility would last forever. A body shouldn't be expected to reward a person like that. A body shouldn't be expected to forget. Later, after my wife fell asleep, I stared up at the ceiling and tried to remember what I had used as a password back when I'd had an online dating profile. Probably the name of a TV show I liked at the time or a street where I no longer lived. Even the solutions to the security questions, I was sure, were answers I could not come up with now. Lev had left me a series of post-its stuck in a row on the cash register. There was one word on each. Thea, did, someone, touch, the, Murano, glass. The last post-it was a frowning face. I was showing a young man a Tiffany pendant lamp with six stained glass parrots sitting atop. It's one of our most popular models, I said. It wasn't. I like the colors, he said, and touched the glass. But is there a way to detach the parrots? There wasn't. As the man stared at the chandelier and tried to understand this, the tobacconist appeared at the door. With relief, my face unfurled. I turned away from the parrots. Oh, she said when we met eyes. It was awful, just awful. She proceeded to tell me while the man listened how the woman she'd met turned out to work as an actuary and she had braces. Now I know why in her picture she's smiling with her mouth closed, the tobacconist said and shook her head. Anyway, the tobacconist went on. I have this splinter. She showed me a palm where a tiny bit of wood was lodged in the skin. Do you think you can take it out? There was a symphony playing on the radio when I reached for her hand, something with many flutes and trills. The man had started playing with the switch, making the parrots blink on and off. I slipped the sliver free, and while the tobacconist and I were still touching, the radio switched to a commercial for a special on a 14 inch meat lover's pizza. I did not tell my wife about this moment. And I did not tell my wife the next day when the tobacconist came to me to ask to fasten a bracelet or the day after when she needed me to snip a tag from her blouse or the times she asked me for aspirin or a paper clip or a thumbtack all things small enough that my hand touched hers in the exchange. I did not tell my wife about the time the tobacconist asked me to work gum from her hair, gum that I had imagined or hoped she'd stuck there just for me to ease out. I did not tell my wife that every day there was a new reason for us to touch because I had no reason to believe each time the tobacconist came to me that she would ever need me again. It never seemed possible from where I stood in my million watt room that she would ever want anything more. And so 
So each night I sank into the passenger seat of my wife's sedan. I shut the door. I told her my day was fine, just fine. And then I turned and reached for the seatbelt so I could strap myself in. Thank you. Claire, that was wonderful. I uh, had read that last week. I don't know whether any people in the audience yet have questions, but let me start by asking you a couple of things that are prompted or that were prompted by this. Um, this may be a multiple part question. So record all of these questions in your mind and then try to formulate an answer. Um, part of my question is uh, a bio biographical question for you. Uh, I'm interested in the importance for a writer of mindless jobs. How many mindless jobs have you had and what kind of usefulness did they have for you? Just put that aside for a moment. That's about you, about Claire Lucchetti. Um, and then with regard to the story, this is a story that builds up uh, and you don't know quite where it's going, but it's a story that begins and ends sort of on matters of procreation. And in between, uh, there are all kinds of questions about vocation and other kinds of creation so that your character turns out to be, at least vicariously, a writer. She's formulating a character for the tobacconist, curating the profile, as you call it. So there are all kinds of matters of creation and procreation going on here. At the same time, so that's the second part of the question. Um, the third question is the two, the, th the three central characters have no names. Uh, the narrator, the wife, and the tobacconist are nameless characters. Why is that? So let me review these for you. Well, you can start, <laughs> with, start with the last one. Why are the characters nameless? and then go back to the first one. What about you and mindless jobs? And then the second question, which is really the big one about the story, creation, procreation, writing, loving. And you really picked two very odd sh shops for this woman to be in, a, sh a chandelier uh, store, and then a tobacconist. That has got to come from something I think maybe in your experience, not your imagination. I'll let that go. And now you improvise something and then we'll go on to the questions from other people. How's that? That sounds great. I've already forgotten everything you just said, but I will answer. I can say it again, but I can. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, so in The Tobacconist, I named the protagonist Thea, which you only learn oh, that... um, through the post-it notes. That's right, that's right, at the end. Um, and I felt like I didn't want to name the wife because she kind of um, just played this role for the narrator, mm -hmm. um, just like the tobacconist. The tobacconist wasn't really a person. She was, she stood in for um, some kind of satisfaction or um, excitement that the narrator needed. Um, and so it wasn't important to me to make them specific individuals, even though I do think that they are probably in a different story um, if they were telling the story. They have a lot to say about themselves for sure, but um, it was more important to me that the way that the narrator saw them was reflected in the story itself. Can you say something? This is a different question entirely. I'll get back to the other ones. Can you say something about the genesis of the story? Where did it come from? A shop, an image, a uh, an issue? Yeah, absolutely. So um, after graduate school, I kind of like, I don't know, roamed around for a while um, in need of a job. I had received this grant, which was really wonderful. Um, but I found that writing all of the time wasn't good for my writing. 
um, because I needed to be in the world and interact with people, um, not just for my mental health, but also for the sake of the writing. Um, and so I was looking for part-time jobs and one of the ones that came up um, was this mindless sales position at a lighting store. Um, and so I had this idea of, you know, talking about the loneliness of standing all day in a store with so many light bulbs. Um, and I knew that I wanted something, uh, I knew that I wanted someone nearby to intrigue the narrator. And I was thinking about how when my family first moved to Chicago, there was um, a cigar store right next to the dry cleaners that my mother went to. And it seemed to me like such a disgusting place for a cigar store to be, um, even though no one's really smoking in cigar stores. It was just the proximity that, um, you know, I was never really comfortable with. <laughs> Um, so then I, I started to kind of combine these ideas and um, the story kind of grew from there. There's a, uh, a question that comes from our neighbor, Stuart Vise, who asks, wonderful, I love this story. Things happen around the narrator more than her being the mover of the plot, such as, such as there is a plot. Could this have been a third person story? That is when you, that's an interesting question, that's when you were devising it, did it ever occur to you to make it third person rather than a first person story? And I think Stuart would then go on to say, and if you had wanted to do that, how would it be different from what we have now? And, and let me ask, by the way, and maybe Bergen can help. I see Stuart's question uh, on my screen does everybody see this or am I having to translate and uh, be the middle man for this? Do you see the question, Claire? I see the question. So I'm assuming that everybody, everyone can see. Okay. So I, I will just repeat that the questions as they come in uh, and Claire can improvise some more. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Stuart, for watching and listening. Um, I think that this seemed like a first person story because it was so immediate. Um, and because the chandelier salesperson's Thea's experience um, was so, so urgent for her to talk about, um, I think it needed to be unfiltered. Um, so therefore a first person. I think a third person version of this story would be um, maybe less funny. And I think whenever I have a third person narrator, A, um, I just am unhappy. <laughs> and B, um, it introduces like this other authorial presence um, that makes it, that just like kind of waters down the story for me. I would think in addition, because one of the central issues or the central issue is fertility and infertility that coming from the voice of the person who is experiencing this problem makes it more powerful than it, if uh, an outside narrator were telling it. Right, yeah, so much of Thea's experience I think is being trapped in um, this chandelier story, yes, but also trapped in a body that has failed her, mm -hmm. um, hasn't, given her what she wanted. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think that the story needed to come directly from Thea in order for us to really feel um, what it was like to be trapped in that body. There's another question now. Your new novel sounds wonderful. Can you talk <laughs> about the process of writing it, especially in contrast to writing short stories? Now, this is where, will your agent be angry if you talk about this novel? I should think not. This is a plug. <laughs> this is a plug for the novel. <laughs> Thank you, Christina, Agatha. for listening and for asking that great question. This, this is, this is a, a friend of yours? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. She was planted. <laughs> yes, I paid her. Um, so 
the way I write all fiction um, and my process for the novel was really similar to how I write stories um, is that I write kind of in bursts. And um, this I realized recently, actually yesterday, I texted all of my friends, or not all of my friends, but some of my friends that I was sorry for the way that I texted them, um, which is really fractured. And um, like I send words just as they occur to me. I record things as soon as I think of them. Um, <laughs> And so as a result, they get like 16 notifications about one idea. And it occurred to me that that would be really annoying. Um, so I felt the need to acknowledge that. Uh, I really admire writers who can compile their thoughts with cohesion and clarity um, and with some sense of where the story is going. But for me, um, the fun of writing and the excitement is so, so small, and that's what I want to protect in the process. Um, getting my syllables right, getting the phonemes right, um, and getting each sentence perfect is the delight for me. And that's where a lot of the pleasure comes. Um, so I'm always building the smallest things on top of each other. Um, and so with the novel, the challenge was then trying to like, you know, figure out where the through line was and figure out how these parts came together or if they came together. Um, and I think because all of the observations of my novel came through, um, again, a first person narrator's voice, um, that for me was what drew one scene or what drew stories, to, what drew scenes together. Um, and what kept them linked um, and propelling one into e another. So it wasn't necessarily a sense of cause and effect, but more um, building sensory detail, building emotion. Um, right, so I never, I never approached the novel writing process with a sense of what it would look like in the end. Um, I kind of just felt my way around in the dark. At what point did you know where it was going? Um, <laughs> uh, probably like last week. <laughs> um, the, the novel has changed a lot since its early forms. Um, and I think um, maybe like about halfway through the process, so a couple years ago, that's when things started to click and feel like they were um, building into something that could be bigger. There was another question that just appeared on the screen. Can we go back from Gustav Mans, another friend perhaps? Or is he a stunning Tony? I don't know. Love the way you combine comic and wistful elements while maintaining a deadpan delivery. Bravo. Is this Thank typical you. of what you aim for in your fiction? <laughs> Why not say yes? Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I'm always aiming to entertain the reader but also move them um, and so, you know, like I, I think it's inescapable for some of my own sarcasm and cynicism uh, to show up in the stories. But I also want to say something that is earnest and emotionally true. Um, so I really admire the work of writers like Laurie Moore who can kind of hit um, both registers in the same story. You mentioned Laurie Moore, and she, of course, was a Merrill lecturer here some years ago. And talk about deadpan delivery and side-splitting laughter. She really knows how to deliver that. Um, from Nikki Gonzalez, how did you decide on a three-part structure for your novel? Well, I thought that was easy. It was poverty, chastity, and obedience, <laughs> or Caesar's three parts for uh, 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 Gaul in uh, Caesar's War. I mean, trinities are good if you're a Catholic girl, right? Exactly, yeah. We just can't get enough of trinities. Um, the structure, hey, Nikki, thanks for asking a question. Um, the structure came to me, it didn't really come to me. I worked on the structure in a number of different forms um, and tried different ways of telling the story. So at some point, 
the form of the story was um, 10 parts and each part um, was one of the 10 commandments. <laughs> oh. And I was trying to like force the structure onto the story, which then required me to like shape shift the story to fit the structure. And that just felt wrong. Um, and so I wanted to choose a simple structure that I knew was um, foolproof and time tested. Um, and that is the three part structure. And then once I thought about um, what happens in each part of the story, it seemed to make the most sense to align those to the vows that nuns take, um, poverty, chastity, obedience. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of my journey to the three-part structure. Can you tell us, uh, I, I know this is still very much uh, a transitional, but what now is the latest publishing uh, schedule? Everything has been delayed and deferred. Do you know, can you tell your fans when they can expect this in their local bookstores, if there are local bookstores? Oh, Willard. Um, it's The last I heard is that the, the book will be out um, in August of 2021, mm -hmm. which seems like a foreign country, but um, when we all make it through, there will be a, a book for everyone to read. <laughs> are, are there more questions from people in the audience? I could keep going all night, but uh, <laughs> I want others to chime in. Can you talk about, oh, thank you, this is good, from our sponsor. Can you talk about the value of a writing residency uh, in the various colonies and other places uh, that you've been and your experience in the Merrill apartment? Is this the first time you've been someplace where you've been alone as opposed to in groups? Yes. That would be, a, that would be an interesting comparison, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think for that reason, it's like the perfect pandemic residency. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's like house arrest. Exactly, <laughs> my dream. <laughs> Um, so I found residencies to be really, really enriching and restorative, um, and also a place where I can kind of, uh, get back in touch with what I'm trying to do in a project. Um, and that's because at a writing residency, um, and a writing residency alone, I think you don't have this much elsewhere um you have the space and time and that's something that isn't valued much outside of you know these small circles um so you're given permission to you know mess around and experiment and um you know do wild things with your craft and then change your mind and see if it failed um so that's that's invaluable to me i actually i spent a year after graduate school, um, kind of residency hopping, which is <laughs> something that uh, bums do, bum artists. Uh, I lined up residencies, month long residencies, one after another, and just went to from one to another. And it was the perfect way to get um, my book done. And, you know, I, it's just like summer camp for adults, but like even better. Um, you know, you're, you're being in some ways very modest because somebody who has just come out of graduate school is very unlikely to land residency after residency with no publications under her belt to show for it. So what you were submitting or what you had already done must have shown more than promise. It must have shown mastery sufficient to impress the people who were reading these applications unless you were bribing them under the table. Willard. I, I'm, I've spoiled the secret, right? Yes, that's, that's how I do things. From Alexandra Tanner, what are you reading right now? And how is it informing what you're working on lately? Pal, pal, great question. Um, so I just finished reading Jillian by Halle Butler, um, which is a really short workplace novel um, about a woman who becomes obsessed with her coworker and the coworker becomes obsessed with um, getting a dog and then their lives just kind of unspiral. Um, or spiral? Spiral. Anyway. Um, <laughs> unwind, unwind. Yes, 
fall apart. Um, and the novel is uh, really funny and really cynical and dark. Um, but it also made me like really depressed. <laughs> so I think the way that it's impacting what I'm working on now is um, kind of showing me what, <laughs> what I don't want to do, which I think is a valuable reading experience. Uh, Cynthia Elliott, who is our valiant, gallant co-leader, intrepid co-leader, wants to know what you are working on during your time in the Merrill House. Actually, that was a question that was asked to a writer who was here two years ago, and she said, I'm not going to tell you, and then ended the program right there. <laughs> she, I mean, she, was old, she was older than you and more <laughs> curious. Um, Cynthia, happy to answer your question. Thank you for asking. Um, I'm working on a new novel that I've been wanting to write for like five years, I'd say. Um, but I had this like pesky nun project. <laughs> um, it's totally different from the nuns. And uh, since it's so new, I don't really know any definites about it yet. Um, but it does involve the postal service and it takes place in a place called Jelloway, Ohio. Can you spell that? Yes, it's Jello, like the dessert. Way W A Y. Yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions from people out there? Is there anything else you would like to tell us about your work in progress? <laughs> no. Um, oh, there you are. Probably it will change tomorrow. Um, so much of the beginning of the process is just like throwing things away. I, here's a question. This is, this is based on something you said earlier. One of the fellows uh, who were here, I think it was two years ago, said, and this is a, a young writer like you, uh, said when he woke up, he took, if he was working on a chapter or something short or a story, he took what he had written and then just put everything back into the computer and started again. So every day was a new beginning with the same material. And I think by that he meant not that he ripped everything apart, but he just started at page one and looked at what he had done and either said stet, let it stand, or changed and but he he would not start at the end where he had left off before he always went back to the beginning now if that's a whole novel you can't go from page 350 back to page one but you can take a section like that and just start over is that something that has any appeal yeah i got really obsessed with the first like 10 pages of my novel and mm -hmm. changed them so much and was so obsessive about getting every word right and making sure every word was the best possible word for what I was trying to do. Um, and I think at some point you like start to ruin it. <laughs> you have to step away. Um, but I don't know what it is about the beginning. I, I think Zadie Smith said that too in an interview that she, like the first 20 pages of her books, she's always obsessing on. Um, I mean, I think you want the reader's early experience of the book to be excellent. Um, but yeah, I'm actually finding that not editing what I've written so far has been really helpful to me because I get bogged down um, in trying to make the language perfect. And so um, in order to start this new project, I have to just generate um, content and scene ideas and um, information. And so this part of the process seems to be about um, getting it out on the page and then the perfecting part comes later. Let me ask you one final short question before we all go off to our um, respective happy hours. Um, the image of the city as a gallbladder did that come to you immediately? Was that the result of your being a physician's daughter? Uh, do you know what a gallbladder looks like? Or was that something that just you invented out of whole cloth? Um, it's funny because uh, I was just saying to my brother, 
that I <laughs> thought I was having a gallbladder attack. Uh -huh. uh, because I'm a bit of a hypochondriac, I uh, am familiar with the shapes of many of our internal organs. Um, and so I was trying to think of a way to describe wound socket um, that would be both tonally right and visually right. And the gallbladder just was perfect. It certainly doesn't make anybody eager to want to visit. Uh, the final question from Beatrice B. Uh, wants to know who is your greatest writing inspiration? Willard. Oh. Thank you, Beatrice. Um, <laughs> uh, my greatest writing inspiration. Uh, it changes every day. Um, it depends on who I'm talking to, what I'm reading, what I see in the world. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, yeah, I got nothing. But I will say that turning to um, the work of Alice Munro, Lori Moore, um, Rachel Kushner's uh, at the Mars Room is a current obsession of mine. Um, just turning to the masters that I admire and um, other writers who are doing the kind of work that I want to be doing. Thank you very much. We've enjoyed this. I think the technology has worked to our advantage. Again, I urge everybody to send in contributions to help support the cause of the Merrill House, but even more important, the cause of literature in this country. Remember, Shelley said, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And given the state of the legislators that we actually have now, I think it might be a better thing to put the poets in Washington than the ones who are there currently. So- Well said, Willard. <laughs> out with the old, in with the new. Thanks, Claire. Bye-bye. Thank yeah. you, Bergen. Thank you, everybody.